But if they were to look at that and they don't have receptors for the orange, then they would see nothing but little brown dots. Most more males have colored uh, blindness than females. Yay, something good. Yeah, yay. We are everything else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if everything else, but they have color blindness. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Visual pathway begins with photoreceptors in the met in the retina. Sensory stimulus passes through the optic nerve and ends at the visual cortex of the opposite cerebral hemisphere. Okay, now I, I gave you a handout. There again, I have to find it. <clears throat> this one here. Let's show the okay. Uh, hard to get this straight. There, but I got it straight. Now that actually shows the crossover. So when you get finished writing this down, just have a quick look at what I've given you here. <clears throat> I'm not really sure. Peter and I were talking on the way up. Why? Why does the body cross over? And we we're trying to figure it out. Because if you have damage on the left side or left side, yeah. you have no function on the right side. So this is the crossover, right? And I have no idea. All we could figure out was primitive man, maybe if they were attacked on one side, would be able to fight with the other side. We don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. It's done that way. It just is. And it's the same with the eyes, only it's proportionate. Part of it crosses over and the other part doesn't. And as you'll see with this, okay. um, this portion crosses over on each side, but the outer portion remains on the right on the same side as the brain tissue. Um, so you'll get portions missing out of your visual field. If you were to have, um, say, an injury to these two, it would your visual field would change, but you'd still have some vision in the injured eye. It would appear to have some vision. Yeah. So that's what these little visual fields are, are portraying right here. The little piece down at the bottom of this paper is just the changes in refraction when you wear glasses. It shows how it works. And I couldn't get them all on one paper, so I ended up sticking these ones down at the bottom of the other page. <laughs> Questions about eyes or anything? You're good? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go on to the ear. The oracle or the pinna is here, which is the outer side of the part of your ear. The con chop is also the outside, but in the center. <clears throat> ear canal. And the ear right here. This is very simple. We'll get onto the bones and the internal structure in a minute. The tympanic membrane is the eardrum. When you look at it, a healthy tympanic membrane is reflects light back at you, so it looks kind of shiny. And also it's clear, you can see through it. If you have an infection, you lose the shininess, it becomes dull, and you can also see behind it, if there is an infection behind you can see a yellow or a white, um, whitish, and you can also see fluid in here. If you were to look with an otoscope down here and this person had some fluid in the inner ear, you can actually see the line of the fluid. <clears throat> Tells you a lot about little guys. Little kids' um, ears, when you look at them, when they come in to emerge with an earache, <clears throat> you can see all that. Otitis externa 
when you talk about otitis, it's the ear. Otitis externa is the ear canal, and you often get kids with um, infection there from swimming. They'll get infection from not clearing the water out of their ears after swimming. And the way you can take care of that is put two drops of alcohol in there and dry it up and they'll get it. They won't get external ear infection. Okay, on to the next one. Maybe. <laughs> the ceruminous glands, which are the you know earwax, earwax glands. They're along the external acoustic canal, so the first before you get to the eardrum. <clears throat> and it helps to capture dirt and debris that get into your ear. And it kind of slows microorganisms down to you by trapping them with the wax. <laughs> kids do such fun things. Um, this is saying it keeps foreign objects out, but it doesn't keep, up. It doesn't <laughs> keep beans, peanuts, or tapioca out. <laughs> okay, they always stick stuff in. <clears throat> we had the CER as one of those boys that yeah. had a car. I don't know what it's like. car I don't know how they do stuff. No. We had a little guy who came in who stuck tapioca, little round tapioca, in yeah. his ear. And what we had to do was really funny, actually. Worked really well. We took the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the car and the dog had to stay in the we I drove down, bought the contact cement. We came and mixed it up, stuck it on the end of a Q-tip, yeah. and then carefully stuck it into the ear canal, and you know stood there for a minute to let it to let it glue, and then pulled it out. It worked really well. Wow, <laughs> that, that, that worked really well. But it was funny though, <laughs> going downtown to buy contact cement. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're on to the middle ear. This is where all of the work takes place. Uh, the auditory ossicles, which are the malleus, incus, and stapes. Now, the malleus, what in layman's terms was the hammer, the incus was the um, anvil, and the stapes was the stirrup. And that's how they got the name. But they do kind of, the stirrup does look, the stapes does look like a stirrup, looks like a horse or part of a saddle. This drawing isn't very clear, and, but I think the one in your textbook is much more clear, so you can see all the parts. And I did give you a handout <clears throat> right here that makes it makes it much more clear. So you can see the middle where the the malleus and and the I can't want to call it the anvil. Incas and the stapes are right in here. And those little bones, when air movement comes down the auditory canal and eardrum, it starts vibrating. And these little bones actually pick it up and it vibrates through these little bones until it gets to the cochlea. Really very delicate. <laughs> it's neat and it's really delicate too. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much going on. It makes you wonder how they all work. Whoops, did they? That skip. Okay, so now this is a bit of a better picture and it shows you um, the tympanic membrane and the ossicles here. And you can see that that is, that is shaped like a little stirrup. That's the same. <clears throat> So it also shows you uh, the branch of the cranial nerve. Five, six, seven. <laughs> this right here. This is the temporal bone. You can see all the little kind of like air cells in the matrix of the temporal bone. 
And if the mastoid bone is connected to air, air cells of the mastoid, the problem with this is people can get mastoiditis from having middle ear infections. The infection actually infiltrates into the bony tissue and into these little air pockets. And this can be very serious because it's then just a step away from the brain because now it's in the bone back here behind your ear. Mm -hmm. And the next step would be into the brain and infect the brain. So if someone has middle ear infections, they should be treated um, before it advances to this. So once it's mastoiditis, it is quite serious. Okay. <clears throat> so the auditory tube, that's different than the auditory canal. The auditory canal is the, the, you know, this part of the ear that goes into the ear. The auditory tube is actually comes down from the middle ear. And you can see it right here. It's coming down right there. And that connects up here <clears throat> in the throat, in the nasal pharynx. And it allows you, when you're going, you're driving over to Merit to teach, <laughs> it allows you to yawn and equalize the pressure from going up and down the mountain. So without being able to equalize the pressure, of course, it would affect your hearing and it can be quite painful if you're flying in an aircraft and you can't equalize the pressure, sometimes you get sharp pains in your ears. And I know that um, babies on airplanes cry a lot. And that's usually because those little eustachian tubes or auditory tubes are very tiny and they can sometimes get swollen and the babies can't equalize the pressure and it's very painful for them. So People who um, complain about babies crying on planes, it's really not their fault. They're just having trouble equalizing the pressure. Yeah, they are. By crying, actually opening their mouth and moving their mouth around can help equalize the pressure. Because I took, I took my um, scuba diving course, and that's one way they taught us to equalize the pressure in our ears is to, you know, to move your jaw around, to to yawn and try to get that equalized. The other big problem with having a tube that's connected to the na nasal pharynx is the fact that that bacteria can crawl up the tube into the middle ear. And oftentimes you'll get children who have a sore throat um, infection of some sort. And that's what's happened. The bacteria have come up that tube into the middle ear and have infected the so then they end up with a, <clears throat> a middle ear infection. Okay. The eustachian tube you're going to hear um, more often in your career than you'll hear auditory tube. They, everybody, all the medical people call it eustachian tube. <clears throat> Vibrations in the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. Like I was saying, um, the sound waves come down the ear canal, and they hit the eardrum, it starts it vibrating, and then it's passed on to the auditory ossicle, and they conduct the vibrations to the inner ear. Uh, all the mums will now know why the kids have earaches and how they get them and <laughs> everything. It's helpful to know this stuff when you're a mother. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have an autoscope that I bought when my son, Steve, my second son, was about a year old because he got repeated ear infections. I got tired of taking him to emergency. Yeah. So I just bought my own. And so I could look and make sure that was the problem. That's why I should be taking Sometimes you never can tell with kids what's the matter. I got really good at looking at kids' ears. <laughs> mm -hmm.
So the inner ear, and when they're talking about the inner ear, they're talking about this part here, this curly thing here that looks like a snail. <clears throat> so the receptors provide hearing, but they also provide equilibrium. This is what keeps our balance. And they're subdivided into the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. They contain a fluid called endolymph, and there it's responsible for vertigo, which is dizziness. There's all sorts of reasons for vertigo. I was reading about, I was trying to find um, information about the one that the crystals form, and you can actually release the crystal by doing all sorts of maneuvers like a physiotherapist or a chiropractor can do it for you. And actually the girl I worked with last weekend in Ashcroft, she had that problem and she was really having a hard time with her equilibrium. Um, and her also, every time she'd turn her eyes or she'd look around, her eyes would, would flutter because equilibrium and vision are connected. So she really didn't have a good day with it. But vertigo can be caused from medications, it can be caused from just being overtired, uh, all sorts of viral infections will give you vertigo. And like I say, the little crystals that form in the cochlea can give you vertigo as well. <clears throat> The cochlea, which contains receptors that provide a sense of hearing, and that's what we talked about the snail shell. This nice little circular thing here is like a snail shell. You can see that. Oops, my needle's not good. Oh, sorry, do you want to go back? Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's me. That's okay. I can say there's no rapture. We're good. It's quarter to five. Oh, I'm thinking, I don't know how much time. I think we have. I hear. We're just about to the end of it. Okay, equilibrium, sensations, receptors in the vestibular complex. And when they talk about the vestibular complex, they're talking about this area right in here. And I hope I have it on the screen properly for the people at home. <clears throat> So it tells us where our head is in relation to what we're doing. Um, if we're bending over, that type of thing. It gives us that information. Um, we have eight is the one, the vestibular cochlear, the acoustic auditory nerve. <laughs> So the information is received by the cerebral cortex and then it's sent on to the cerebellum. So this is sensory and then the motor commands are sent to the periphery via the brain stem and spinal cord. So if you were bending over and you didn't feel so great and you stood back up, the motor command would have been Sent to you to stand up again. So that's what that's for.
So this is just the same or similar picture to the one that I've given you already. You've already got to copy that. And aging effects, the tympanic membrane becomes less flexible because it's like a drum, so it loses its flexibility. And you lose your low pitches first and then your higher pitches next. And for some reason, I don't have a problem talking to people with hearing difficulty, and it's just the pitch of my voice. It probably is the higher pitch. That's why they can hear me. You just jump. That wasn't the end. <laughs> just jump back to it. Okay. Any questions at all? Well, I finished a little bit early today, which is okay because you can work on that um, poster. And then I'll just, I'll just say goodbye to everybody online because we're done. That was the end of it.